as a painting You must have heard a lot about me For I lived here for many happy years Never dreaming that you could ever do without well, the Blue Boy Blues, a Cole Porter song popular in 1922, lamenting the departure of The Blue Boy, a painting by Thomas Gainsborough. It was sold to an American tycoon for a record sum to the dismay of art lovers here who queued for hours to see it before it was shipped across the Atlantic. Now, it's back in the UK and will go on public display at the National Gallery tomorrow, exactly 100 years since it left for America. Well, earlier I spoke to Philip Hook, former director of modern art at Sotheby's, and Adam Buziakowicz, a art historian and lecturer for the Art Society. And I began by asking Adam why the Blue Boy was such a special picture. Well, it's a truly iconic work of British art from the mid-18th century or the later part of the 18th century by... Thomas Gainsborough, which shows a very um, flamboyant young man standing in, a, in an atmospheric and highly romanticised landscape with his hand on his hip, striking this magnificent pose. But what is really captivating about it is the magnificent way the costume is painted. This young boy is literally covered in a, in a silk costume with a, with a so-called Van Dyck collar, a type of collar which imitates... Um, dress that existed in the 17th century, made popular by Anthony van Dyck in British portraiture. And it's, it's a marvellous painting, um, so evocative of that period in the 18th century when Gainsborough created it. And Philip, just tell us a little bit about the story of the painting, because, um, I mean, it's been quite a famous painting for many years, and in fact, many people were very distressed when it was sold overseas. Well, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and it was sold exactly 100 years ago in 1922. Um, it it's really is one of those very famous paintings that, that people recognise. And it's one of those whose image is so familiar that they transcend their original functions as works of art. You, you, you might almost say it's in the same league as the Mona Lisa or the Scream by Edvard Munch because... Uh, it's that familiar, but it's a portrait of, by Gainsborough, of his nephew, um, Gainsborough Dupont, and it was in the collection of the Duke of Westminster, uh, and then in 1922, Joseph Duveen, who was this absolutely marvellous showman art dealer, who sold works of art for huge prices, generally from European collections to rich Americans, managed to find a huge bid of $728,000, um, which persuaded the owner, the, 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 the Duke of Westminster, to sell the picture to this um, American tycoon called Henry Huntington. So off went this wonderful image, this quintessentially British portrait to America in 1922. And there were people, uh, Adam, literally queuing up to catch the last glimpse of it a hundred years ago. Cole Porter even wrote a song about it. Yes, I can imagine the the massive publicity that the sale of this such iconic painting must have um, must have well, must have inspired, and and this generally does happen. I'm sure Philip knows about about such stories more than I do. But but sometimes the sale of these great works of art do just capture the public imagination in a, in a rather amazing way. And I think we re, we experience this ourselves in our own time in 2017 when Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi was sold for over $450 million. I mean, that that was a story that, that spread across the world. And, and certainly in 1921-22, when The Blue Boy was sold, I, I, I think it's, it's very much a similar sort of equivalence, really. Yeah, I'm reading that uh, 90,000 people queued up to say goodbye to the picture. Philip, do you think there's going to be much excitement when this painting goes on show to the public tomorrow? 
Well, I'm sure they will. I do hope that the National Gallery has managed to dig out a recording of Cole Porter's song, which uh, is called Blue Boy Blues, apparently. And uh, one of the lines in it is uh, how the blue boy left the gilded galleries of Park Lane. Um, I, I don't know whether any, anyone's actually got a recording of that song, but it would be it, it was an indication of quite how topical the whole thing was a hundred years ago. Adam, it's been out of the country for a hundred years. It's now back. There's a lot of excitement in the art world uh, and perhaps more widely. It, it, it clearly is a beautiful and a very evocative painting. But why do certain paintings like this, like as we were hearing the Mona Lisa or Munch's The Scream, why do certain pictures like this take on that uh, wider significance and appeal to a public beyond those dedicated art uh, lovers? Well, firstly, I would say it's a fantastic painting that has to be seen with your own eyes. Gainsborough was a true magician when it came to painting fabrics, textures, and also a, a facial likeness that was living and breathing as he described it. So as a work of art and an aesthetic object, it's beautiful. So that's one point. But also I think the story about its sale in the 1920s was, was also one of the reasons that it became so famous and so well known. Um, Franz Hals's The Laughing Cavalier, of course, did the same when it sold in 1860 to the Marquis of Hartford, who paid such an enormous price. That was that sale really regenerated an interest in Franz Hals. So it's certainly the stories um, and the media hype that that makes um, or that can make works of art famous and and um, and certainly uh, distribute them amongst the wider population. But it really is a wonderful thing that they are going to be well it, that it's back in London. And you know we live in a very dull, awful age of NFTs and 3D printed artworks. I'm so glad that the real living object painted in 17th century by Gainsborough will be back in London. That so that people can actually come and see it most of all, which is. After these few years of, of you know, I'm, I'm awfully sick of screens. I don't know about you. <laughs> yeah, Philip. <laughs> uh, wonderful to know that this is a, a, an actual painting, no, not 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 an NFT, not not an online um, work of art or something uh, quite obscure that um, certain people will love and and others will hate. Philip, what what do you think it is that makes a painting like this something that? resonates with a wider public beyond those who are dedicated to lovers and critics of art? Well, it's a very fascinating thing, the way this does happen. As I said earlier, it happened to the, Mos it's happened to the Mona Lisa, it's happened to the Scream, and maybe also Van Gogh's Sunflowers. They are images that people recognise, that people who don't know very much about painting do still nonetheless know. Uh, and one of the things I think that heightened the excitement about the men losing the screen was that they were both stolen uh, in their histories and created enormous media interest when that happened. And I think there's a parallel here in that the Blue Boy, while it wasn't stolen, uh, did leave Britain and there was a sense of loss about it, which focused which focused imaginations on it, and I just think it's the most wonderful image. I mean, it's 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 what people in the trade call a swagger portrait. It's the ultimate swagger portrait, called a swagger portrait because the subject has such self confidence that they seem to swagger, and that's exactly what the wonderful boy in blue does. And Adam, of course, it's only here on loan. Um, you've only got a few weeks if you want to actually go and see it. Um, but it clearly will provide a, a further boost to the National Gallery. And it, it has been a difficult time, hasn't it, for galleries that were closed for a while, then they were open, but only allowing limited numbers in and so on. Yes, it's been an absolutely awful time for London's museums and galleries. Visitor numbers have been shockingly low. But I really do hope that particularly since it seems that we're sort of over the worst of uh, the recent wave, that the visitors are going to go back and, and have a look at these beautiful objects in person. I've been doing so for many months now. And the first time that I've walked amongst 
real paintings and uh, and uh, strolled through places like the National Gallery and the Wallace Collection. It really it really reminded me of what a special thing it is to see a work of art in person, in the flesh. And I, I can't wait to see the Blue Boy in person. I, I've of course never seen it in person, so it will be an exciting time for me. And and as I mentioned before, I'm absolutely sick of screens, and I, I do imagine that there are a lot of people that feel exactly like me. Uh, yeah, I mean, Philip, it, it is going to be a bit of a boost, isn't it, for those galleries? But the, the, the art market uh, has actually been holding up pretty well during the pandemic, hasn't it? It's been the most extraordinary success story, the art market. I mean, I, I was among those people who felt that um, COVID and people not actually being able to see pictures um, before they buy them would be very, very damaging to the market. And But quite the reverse, a whole new stream of buyers has come through, um, often from Asia, who are perfectly happy to spend many millions of pounds on a work of art, even though they haven't actually seen the original. And um, that's, uh, well, to my, um, to my mind, that's a bit shocking. But that is how it's panned out. And um, a lot of money has been paid uh, over the past sort of two years. And our prices have risen and risen. And even if people can't afford those as sort of astronom astronomical sums which are paid for certainly some of our greatest works of art, um, Adam, anyone could go along and see this. Do you think it is the sort of painting that's going to attract people who wouldn't necessarily consider an art gallery as their first port of call? Well, I do hope so, but you're absolutely right to point out that we live in an age where people are, I, I suppose, quite literally knocking figures off plinths. Um, and as I mentioned before, we live in a very strange world where real objects matter less and less. Think about NFTs, think about the metaverse. But I, I quite honestly say going to look at real paintings and, and also the equivalence of listening to live music again, um, these are wonderful experiences that we have in our world and in our lives to bat away the darkness and mundanity of the modern world. And I do hope um, visitors will give it a chance. It's a beautiful painting, um, so iconic for so many reasons, and, and uh, most of all, of course, because, because Gainsborough, its creator, was such a magician. So I do hope it inspires um, all those who go and, uh, and see it. <laughs> Adam Bujakiewicz, art historian and lecturer for the Art Society, and Philip Hook, former director of Modern Art at Sotheby's, on one of the world's great pictures uh, on show at the National Gallery from tomorrow. You're listening to Times Radio.